It's really nice to be back, and I just want to thank you for the kind invitation and introduction. Um, so we're here because we're all interested in health on some level. It might be disparities, inequities, disability, health behaviors. Um, for me, it's the developmental origins of children's health and the ways in which children's health develops within the context of the family. So when, some, when a child has some sort of condition or illness, it doesn't just happen to that child, it happens to the entire families. And I think we can all agree that families in turn are one of the strongest influences of, ch of health in early childhood. So what I'm gonna talk about today is fathers as being an important part of that family system. And I'm gonna present some of my research that demonstrates how their involvement impacts the overall welfare of mothers and children. Um, I'm going to put all of this in the context of a well-known maternal and child health paradigm, which is the life course approach. And I found that very useful when I've been investigating these issues um, since I started doing research. I just, before I begin with all of that, I want to take just a moment to acknowledge the diversity of fathering. Most children in the U.S. have a father, whether he's currently residing with them or living separately. Some children have a single father or two parents who are both fathers. Children in blended families might have a residential stepfather and a biological father who lives outside of the home. And some children don't have a male figure involved in their parenting um, in raising them at all. So in other words, I just want to say that I know that there are many different types of families and ranges of household compositions and experiences of children in the US. When I talk about dads and fathers today, I'm referring really broadly to the male or males um, who are most involved in the caregiving and committed to the children's well-being, regardless of their living situation or their biological status, their marital relationship or custody of the kids. Uh, in, in the cases where I present work on a more narrow range of fathers, I will make that disclaimer at the time. But I just want to acknowledge that um, I realize that this doesn't speak to the full ranges of experiences of, of children in the U.S. But I think that engaging fathers and young men in family health is a topic that's of great concern to the maternal child health and family well-being community. And I hope my talk today sort of piques your interests and helps inform your, your research in the area. So before I talk about the importance of fathers, I want to spend a moment giving a brief um, overview of my educational background because some of the unique experiences I've had pretty early on inform a lot of the work that I do today. Um, as mentioned, I began my educational career at Indiana University where I earned a Bachelor's of Science in Public Affairs. My first job after college was as a Medicaid case manager at a community hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. In this role, I helped uninsured patients enroll in Medicaid. So basically, a uh, patient would come to the hospital with no insurance, and I would go to them with um, a flag would enter the system, and I would show up with a Medicaid application and a list of services to connect the patient with resources in the community. This experience was really transformative for me because it opened my eyes to the various needs of patients who are seeking medical care. I saw that these patients were in need of health care, obviously, but they also were affected by stress, financial burden, they lived in unsafe neighborhoods, they needed jobs, safe housing, child care. Um, and I realized that these factors in health are very interrelated, and importantly, I recognized that improving individual health would require an integration of services beyond the healthcare system. Um, so I ultimately, this experience led me to pursue a master's degree in public affairs from the University of Wisconsin at La Follette, um, where I focused on healthcare policy and vulnerable populations. I was really interested in mental health amongst recently incarcerated individuals and the recidivism that happens sometimes as a result of not being able to have access to appropriate mental health care. Um, I then decided to continue my studies at UW with a PhD in population health sciences, which provided me with training in epidemiology, biostatistics, and public health. And there I focused on social um, and life course determinants. I finished that degree in 2013, and I was accepted into the Harvard Pediatric Health Services Research Fellowship. Um, during this time, I, in, I started integrating my health policy background and training into um, health services. And so how, how can we improve health services as a way to address some of these issues? In 2015, I accepted a tenure track faculty appointment at the Indiana University School of Medicine within the section of children's health research. So when I'm looking at this trajectory, there's a couple moments that really jump out at me as being really um, influential to what I'm doing now. And one of these moments happened when I was here. So I just want to talk about it for a second. I was a master's student. It really changed the course of my career. And it drove me to do um, into a research career as opposed to a policy career. Because up until that point, I wanted to go to Washington. I wanted to write policy. I wanted to be a lobbyist, an advocate. Um, and then you know something switched, and I decided that I would rather do research. So it was in the spring of 2009. I was here. I was a master's student. Um, I was doing, 
I was interested in healthcare for vulnerable populations, and I went to a seminar on social justice. One of the speakers was Chris Coe from the Institute of Aging, who I'm sure some of you at least know. That he um, is heavily involved in primate research here on campus. So his presentation, if you remember, this was a social justice conference. Um, it was about rhesus macaque monkeys. So here's a picture of a couple of rhesus macaque monkeys. And it was specifically about a trial he led that randomized pregnant monkeys to either a controlled water schedule, so only drinking water, or a daily ration of apple juice, a few liquid ounces per day, not very much, in addition to their usual diet. So water or water plus apple juice. Um, so the monkeys were given these liquids throughout the course of their pregnancy. When the monkeys gave birth, uh, Dr. Coe and his team offered the baby monkeys the choice of drinking either water or apple juice. And lo and behold, the babies that were exposed to just a very moderate amount of apple juice in utero were much more likely to choose that as a beverage for themselves as they were to drink water. Um, this is the concept of fetal programming, and it just completely blew my mind. Up until that point, I was really convinced that everybody enters the world with a clean slate. They have equal social health opportunities that diverge as you grow up. This is what I believed in, and my scholarly interests in health policy focused on, exclusively focused on postnatal experiences. But the idea that trajectories towards health or certain illnesses can be set in motion when the baby is still in the womb, it just really fascinated me, and it totally changed my path. I was really inspired. I began to think about the link between social problems and health as having early life and developmental origins, and I started to think about the, the need to focus more upstream towards prevention. A few months after Dr. Coe's presentation, this fetal origins hypothesis really hit mainstream. There was a publication of Amy Paul's book called Origins and a Time magazine cover that kind of focused on this line of research. And as I said, it totally changed my path. I became really interested in the science, the causal mechanisms, and prevention of health inequities. And I started to think about the need to focus on chronic disease as a developmental process that evolves over time and not just something that arises at a fixed point in time. So basically, this is the life course perspective. And what Chris Coe's research found and what the life course perspective theorizes is summarized in this figure, where the x-axis represents time, and there are certain time points in the, in the person's life, and the y-axis uh, represents their health potential. So higher health potential is, is better. Um, and over time, you have these protective factors that increase your health potential, the green arrows that kind of increase your health potential, and risk factors work, which work against your health potential. Um, over time. And in the ideal situation, you have your protective factors outweigh your risk factors, and you have this great chance of reaching your optimal life trajectory. But more often than not, repeated exposure to risk across the lifespan tempers the impact of these protective factors, and health inequities are the results. It's the difference between your optimal life trajectory and the life trajectory in, uh, impacted by inequity. Um, and that's the and so health inequities represent the difference between health outcomes you have as a result of repeated exposure to risk and the health of those who are not exposed to such risk. And then within this framework, there is the developmental origins disease or fetal origins hypothesis, which basically says that conditions in utero program the fetus for the development of chronic disease in adulthood. So that there are these early programming effects of exposures during pregnancy or the kind and quantity of nutrition you receive in the womb, pollutants, drugs, infections you're exposed to during gestation, your mother's health, stress, state of mind when she's pregnant, all of these factors shape you as a baby and continue to shape you through, these day, through this day. And then you have cumulative pathways of daily life experience that determine your health throughout life. So experiences like early neglect, academic achievement, and the experience of parenting can all act as either risk or protective factors that accumulate over time to impact your health. That's basically what the life course perspective suggests. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about some examples from my own research that integrated this idea of a life course approach um, to health and disease. So first, I'll tell you about a series of studies that I worked on as a graduate student here at UW that focused on the effects of women's stress before pregnancy on birth outcomes. And the reason why I'm going to talk about birth outcomes is because they're actually a really great topic to apply the life course perspective to. Um, first, because rates of preterm birth and low birth weight are really high in the United States. So what you see on this chart is the percentage of babies who are born low birth weight in the US over time from 2000 to about 2013. Um, and as you can see, the percentage of underweight babies increased between 2000 and 2006. And this followed sort of a long period of in increasing rates that dated back to the 1980s. 
since about 2007, rates appear to be stable or slightly declining. However, the latest data reveal that still about 8% of babies in the US are born low birth weight every year. Um, we see really similar patterns for preterm birth and a lot of maternal morbidity measures, maternal mortality, and really shockingly high levels of racial and ethnic disparities within these outcomes. I know that all of you are probably familiar with those data. Uh, the second reason why this is a good topic for a life course approach is because preterm birth and low birth weight rates and the associated disparities have not really improved despite increased access to and utilization of prenatal care. So the good news is, is that in the US, most women receive early and adequate prenatal care. So as this chart shows, rates of prenatal care have actually increased since the 1970s. These data are slightly old, but since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, um, in 2017, over almost 90% of women giving birth in the United States began prenatal care in the first trimester, and nearly all of these women received what we call an adequate number of visits. So healthcare is, is available to pregnant women, which is great. Um, so prenatal care rates are so high because most public health efforts to address disparities in birth outcomes focus primarily on increasing access to healthcare, which is great, and on encouraging women to adopt healthy behaviors during, preg during pregnancy. So things like increasing physical activity and exercise, eating a wide variety of food, these things um, are all given to women as advice to how to have healthy pregnancies. Um, but these efforts, as I've mentioned, have not really closed the gap that we see in terms of racial and ethnic disparities in birth outcomes or lowered the overall presence, uh, prevalence of birth outcomes um, to like the healthy, healthy People 2020 goal, for example. So if you think about this from a life course perspective, the reason why we still see such high rates of poor outcomes is because disparities um, are the consequences of differential exposure to risk and protective factors that occur not only during pregnancy, but across the entire lifespan of women. So eliminating these disparities will require in interventions that are more longitudinally focused. And what I mean by that is that most research on risk factors for disparities and even in traditional healthcare delivery one developmental stage of life often gets disconnected from the next. So in perinatal health, we focus so much on the events occurring in the nine months of pregnancy that we forget about all the other life course periods that might be relevant to women's health. So many of us can agree that to expect prenatal care in less than nine months to reverse the cumulative disadvantage that women, ha that women face over their lifespan might be expecting a little too much of prenatal care. So if we're serious about thinking about improving outcomes and reducing disparities, we have to start taking care of women and families, not only during pregnancy, but before pregnancy and between their pregnancies and indeed across their entire life course. So as a graduate student here, uh, I, was I was interested in this topic. I was really fueled by Chris Coe's research and I began on a series of studies about the impact of exposures during the preconception period, so prior to pregnancy, on pregnancy outcomes. Uh, we looked at stress as a potentially um, salient risk factor for women during this time frame, in part because there's strong evidence to show that stress during pregnancy is a risk factor for poor birth outcomes. So we hypothesized that women who experience stress before their pregnancies um, would have a greater likelihood of experiencing a poor pregnancy outcome than if women hadn't experienced stress. Uh, we examined data from the early childhood longitudinal study birth cohort, which is the only longitudinal birth cohort in the United States. Um, the data collection started in 2001, and um, the data were collected over four study waves lasting until the children were, about, were entering school past kindergarten age. So from this data set, we examined over 9,300 live births, which there's, this was a weighted national sample, so it was about 3.7 million births in the weighted sample. Our primary independent variable was exposure to stressful life events prior to conception, so, which we conceptualized as the death of the respondent's parent, spouse, previous live-born child, divorce or separation from their partner or fertility problems that occurred any time prior to the date of conception, which we determined from the birth certificate data. And we found in this nationally representative sample that almost 20% of women reported experiencing at least one of these events prior to their pregnancies. And when compared with the population of women who did not experience these events, these, women's were more, these women were more likely to deliver infants that were smaller and who were born early. These effects were statistically significant after controlling for stress experienced during pregnancy, as well as maternal demographic characteristics, um, pregnancy risks, and family socioeconomic factors. So these studies provided evidence that the period before conception might be a sensitive period uh, with ramifications for pregnancy and infant outcomes. So they were aligned with a life course approach by moving beyond what we know about the influence of stress during pregnancy to consider how the experiences of women across the lifespan 
uh, affect their prenatal health and birth outcomes and set the stage for children's subsequent health over time. Um, when I was a fellow, I started thinking about what all this meant for childhood obesity. Because as probably all of you know, childhood obesity is a national and global, global public health epidemic. Since 1980, uh, the obesity prevalence among children under the age of 18 has tripled. Today, over 35% of children in the US will be overweight or obese by their fifth birthday. Um, even our youngest children are affected with evidence showing that over 8% of children younger than two years of age have a weight for length above the 95th percentile, which predisposes them for subsequent obesity. While there was hope in the past couple of years that we were making gains on obesity, particularly in the two to five age range, um, the latest evidence shows that obesity rates are actually increasing among all age groups. And importantly, racial and ethnic and socioeconomic disparities are widening with black, Hispanic, and low income children disproportionately bearing the burden and its um, consequences. The health and consequence, the consequences of obesity are costly and include, among other things, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, depression, um, and other physical and psychosocial problems. Importantly, from a life course perspective, children who are obese tend to become adults with obesity. And once present, obesity is um, notoriously hard to treat with most clinical trials in early childhood showing limited to no effectiveness in the long term. So given the difficulty of treating obesity once present, there's been increasing focus on the prevention of obesity early in the lifespan. So we wanted to know uh, the extent to which the first 1,000 days, which is the period of between conception through 24 months, is a crucial period for the development and the, therefore prevention of obesity and its consequences. So we asked the question, can one's predisposition to overweight and obesity be programmed in utero? We conducted a systematic review um, of the literature on prenatal programming of childhood obesity. We specifically wanted to identify risk factors during the first 1,000 days. Uh, this research was highlighted in a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation issue brief slightly after publication. And we did, in fact, find that a number of factors during this period are linked to childhood obesity, including maternal gestational diabetes, smoking during pregnancy, poor nutrition both during pregnancy and in the early postpartum, and rapid infant weight gain in the first six months of life. So the life course approach has been really important for this work because it tells us first that health trajectories are built over the lifespan. So in other words, health is not something that's fixed in time. It's something that arises from a continuum of exposures, experiences, and interactions. What this means is that early experiences can program an individual's future health and development. So in other words, adverse experiences and exposures have the greatest impact on health at specific, specific or um, critical or sensitive periods of development such as during the first 1,000 days between uh, the period of pregnancy and early childhood. From a health services perspective, it implies that intervening early and during sensitive periods can change outcomes. The second thing I've learned from the life, the life course perspective is that the broader environment strongly affects the capacity to be healthy. So children's social, economic, and physical environments ha can have a profound impact on their health. At the most basic level, this means that we really can't talk about child health without talking about the well-being of families. Um, but also my work focused on perinatal outcomes shows that the lives of moms and infants are uniquely linked, um, shaping and being shaped by each other over time in the continuing process of human development. So as I was doing this research on, in the maternal child health realm, I noticed that there was something missing from all of this and the broader discussion of life course in general, and that was the role of fathers. Excuse me. Um, the life course perspective actually does not explicitly include fathers, and both the preconception health literature and, interestingly, in obesity prevention research, the role of fathers is vastly overlooked, and that represents, in my opinion, a big missed opportunity for both research and intervention. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about why fathers are important. Um, as it turns out, I wasn't the only one thinking this. Michael Liu, who is one of the leaders of the life course research field, he posed the same question in one of his papers. Um, asking where is the F in maternal and child health? So why should we, as advocates for a child's health and well-being, care about this topic? Well, for one thing, because changing family dynamics um, mean that fathers are increasingly present in their children's lives. According to the census, the number of fathers who are stay-at-home dads or who are the primary caretakers of their children has doubled over recent decades, and today over two million homes fit this model. So that's almost 20% of the stay-at-home parent population are stay-at-home 
dads. Uh, the number of single father households has also dramatically increased. And today, a, rec a record 8% of households with minor children in the US are headed by a single father. So that's more than 2.6 million households in the US compared with just over 1% of households in 1960. If you look at the single parent household population, so just those households where there's a single parent, 24% of these, so one in, four, one in four of these households are headed by fathers. Being present means that fathers today are much more involved in their children's care than they were 50 years ago. Um, if you look at the group of fathers who live with their children, these men have become more intensely involved in their children's lives, they spend more time with them, and they take part in a greater variety of parenting activities. At the same time, we see more and more children who grow up without a father in the home, as the share of fathers who reside with their children has also fallen significantly in the past half century. So in this figure, you see between 1960 and 2010, um, in 1960, the percentage of children who lived without their, um, who lived without their fathers was 11%. By 2010, that share had risen to 27%. Father's living arrangements are strongly correlated with socioeconomic and demographic factors. Children who live apart from their children are more likely to be black, younger, and less educated than fathers who live with their children. And among those fathers who, ha who don't live with their children, um, over 25% of them seem to be absent as they report not having seen their children in the, in the previous 12 months. So if you're asking what all this has to do with maternal and child health, it turns out a lot. According to many indicators of maternal, according to research, many indicators of maternal and child health are significantly impacted by the involvement of the child's father. We know that greater engagement of fathers in the prenatal period is associated with early prenatal care and improved birth outcomes, including reductions in prematurity and infant mortality. Children with fathers who are engaged early in life have higher academic achievement. They're less likely to use substances, and they have fewer aggressive and problem behaviors than do children who grow up without a father figure. In my own research, I've looked at the impact of father involvement on both perinatal outcomes and um, early childhood obesity risk. So first, as a fellow, I investigated the relationship between antenatal partner support. So partner support during pregnancy is reported by women in their first trimesters with women's psychological health and health behaviors during pregnancy. So for this study, we examined data on over 1,700 women participating in Project Viva, which is a pre-birth cohort of mothers and their children residing in Massachusetts, in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, Project Viva recruited participants during their first prenatal visit and has followed them and their children um, for over 12 years. The main exposure in this study was partner support that was assessed during the first trimester using a scale that asked mothers to report about anticipated financial assistance, affection, emotional support, and caretaking responsibilities um, once the baby was born. And when we looked at the group of women who reported low partner support, so who perceived their partners as not contributing in these areas, they were much more likely to also report antenatal depression and anxiety than women who reported high partner support. Um, they were also over two times more likely to use tobacco during pregnancy. When thinking about the association of father factors to early life obesity risk, I wanted to conduct this study because, again, there's really a shockingly low number of studies on children's early life obesity risk that even considers how fathers might be influential. So we looked at administrative data. Specifically, um, the Century Study is a cohort of birth certificates linked to children's electronic medical records um, for over 2,000 children who are in the healthcare system in Boston, Massachusetts. Within this cohort, we examined the availability of paternal information on the birth certificate as a proxy for father involvement. So birth certificates that were missing this information were considered to be those where the father involvement was rather limited. And we found that the availability of these data on the birth certificate was independently related to perinatal risk factors for childhood obesity, including um, higher rates of smoking during pregnancy, lower rates of breastfeeding initiation, and reduced birth weight. Um, among, um, we also observed higher odds of children ever having crossed uh, weight for length above the 95th percentile, which predisposes them for subsequent obesity. So in addition, in, in addition to examining how fathers impact maternal and child health, I've looked at how child health and, experience, and the experiences of becoming a father can impact men. So research does show that like mothers, men undergo significant transitions during the periods of pregnancy and childbirth. So the experience of having a child is transformative for both men and women, and it's something that's increasingly being recognized as having 
both positive and negative impacts on men's health and well-being. So one area that's been fairly well studied in this domain is depression. So although the vast majority of evidence still lies with mom and in terms of postpartum depression, there is some evidence that men also experience depression after the birth of a child. Postnatal depression rates in men are estimated at about 10%. And even though this estimate is lower than what is typically reported for women, it's still quite high, 1 in 10. Um, it might be worthy of prevention and intervention because we know how much mom's depression impacts children's health and well-being. So the evidence shows that the experience of becoming a father can lead to depression in men. We also know that maternal depression in the postpartum period impacts children's development. But what is really less clear and less well studied is the extent to which father's postpartum depression impacts children's development. So I decided to examine this issue um, within families of preterm children who I expected to be more fragile in terms of both postpartum parental depression and poor cognitive development. So I wanted to see what the extent to which men's father's postpartum depression and prematurity negatively impact um, the cog children's cognitive development. So I looked at data from the first two waves of the early, ch early childhood longitudinal study birth cohort, that same longitudinal birth co cohort we looked at before. Uh, we used the first, we used families that participated in the first two waves. So uh, responses from the mother, the biological father, resident or non-resident, um, and the children. Within this cohort, 78.6% were married heterosexual couples at baseline, which was at nine months. Um, the sample also included 8% non-resident biological fathers. 10.5% um, 10, 10 of the children in the sample were born preterm, and 1.5% were born very preterm, or before 32 weeks. So looking at the baseline data, again at nine months, we found that depression in parents of young children was pretty prevalent. 14% of mothers and about 11% of fathers endorsed clinically significant symptoms of depression when, um, when their children were nine months old. We saw even higher rates of depression among fathers of children born preterm. 20, 25% of fathers of preterm infants um, reported depression. And non-resident biological fathers were also very vulnerable, almost 30% of the non-resident biological dads. We then looked at the impact of children's preterm status and, these and their parents' depression on their cognitive function at 24 months of age. So pre prematurity, parental depression at nine months, on cognitive function at 24 months. Um, our outcome of interest was a cognitive um, developmental scale called the Bailey Scales, of, or, of, called the Bailey short form, which was a short form of the Bailey Scales of Infant Development, which is a well-validated scale for cognitive development in this age group. Um, so in our multivariable model, we first regressed preterm status on children's cognitive scores. And we saw the same thing as many others have found in this population, that being that children born preterm have lower cognitive function than children born at term, and this is even two years after birth. Um, then we added in parental depression scores, and there was not an attenuation of this effect. So instead of seeing, um, so rather the effect of children's preterm status on their cognitive functions seemed to operate completely independently of their parents' mental health. But what we did see in this model was evidence that parental depressive symptoms in both moms and dads was prospectively associated with lower cognitive function in their children. So while we expected this from mothers and it supports a lot of the existing literature on this topic, what was interesting here was the independent effect of fathers postpartum depressive symptoms on later cognitive outcomes for their children. So on the final model, after we adjusted for covariates, the impact of maternal depression was completely attenuated. Um, but father's depression still remained a significant predictor. So although the effect size here is pretty small, it was highly statistic statistically significant. And I think that tells us that father's depression really does matter for children's early cognitive development. And given that 10% of fathers experience postpartum depression, early childhood may be a critical period for intervention for both men and their children. So these studies demonstrate the importance of fathers to several, several perinatal outcomes in early maternal and child health. Importantly, they also show that fatherhood affects men. Uh, the implication here is that fathers might be a potential target for interventions to improve perinatal and early childhood health outcomes, but it also suggests a need to recognize, men, recognize men's health in the postpartum period. So in thinking about depression, there's been a ton of research paid to the identification and treatment of depression in new mothers and the importance of doing so, but little evidence documents, documents the frequency of efforts to address depression or other health problems among new fathers. Um, Moreover, I think despite the importance of father's involvement to maternal and child health, there's a lack of existing research 
on how to increase and improve a father's involvement with his child. So right now, I'm a pediatric health services researcher, and I think about how to target fathers within healthcare settings as a strategy to improve children's health. Uh, the healthcare setting is a key channel for, um, for health promotion, but it's not one that's always thought of as being father-friendly. And even though many maternal and child health programs advocate for a family-centered approach to care, the explicit focus in terms of prenatal, postnatal, and pediatric care is to provide access to comprehensive services for mothers and their children. I think this, again, is a big missed opportunity to improve children's health. This topic is very near and dear to me because I recently became a mother. Um, <laughs> when I was pregnant and so far during my, first, uh, my son's first year of life, my husband has attended every visit to the obstetrician and pediatrician with us. Um, during pregnancy, the nurses were always so surprised that he was with me, and they would say, wow, it's, like, it's so great to have dad here. It just really threw him off. Um, but my husband's participation in this area was not something that we explicitly discussed, other than me saying, you know, we have an OBGYN appointment tomorrow, and him saying, like, okay, I'll pick you up, or I'll meet you there. And from the minute our son was born, I expected him to join me in these efforts as part of a parenting team, along with changing his share of the diapers and getting up with me in the wee hours of the night. Um, but what I've noticed at these doctor visits, both during pregnancy and now as a pediatrician, I will say I love my pediatrician, is that most medical professionals, they will acknowledge my, hus my husband's presence, but they direct their questions and comments about our son to me. Um, on rare occasions, when they do include him in the conversation, they talk about ways for him to encourage mom or to help out, um, as though he's just an extra hand. And it's frustrating that we rarely, if ever, receive information about the critical role that he as a father can play in advancing our son's well-being. And I see a lot of smiles in the audience, which means that other people have experienced this as well. I know it's not. there's a lot of young students in here who are not experienced in this area, but for those of us that are parents, I don't think that this is an isolated thing that only happens in Indianapolis. I think this is something that um, is sort of systemic across, across the US. So obviously, I think it's important to not only recognize the unique contributions of fathers to healthy children development, but to encourage healthcare professionals to make an extra effort to support and involve them more often. So I started thinking about this topic actually a few years before I became pregnant when I was a health services research fellow. As you recall, my graduate training was mostly epidemiolo epidemiological in focus. So fellowship was this major um, shift in environment. Obviously, Boston was very culturally different from Madison. But also professionally, I was surrounded entirely by physician scientists. And this environment really showed me and opened the door to doing health services and to think more broadly about fathers in healthcare settings that matter for children. Um, and those would be obstetrics and pediatrics. So I collaborated on a project in, during fellowship in partnership with the Fatherhood Project. They are a nonprofit fatherhood program in the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. Their mission is to improve the health and well-being of children and families by empowering fathers to be knowledgeable, active, and emotionally engaged with their children. So the Fatherhood Project team approached um, the nurses within the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, they're called Vincent Obstetrics, to see if, they're, if they would be interested in creating um, more father-friendly approaches to their prenatal services. So the nurses were, were totally into that because they knew the fathers were there, but they didn't really know what to do about it. Um, so we decided to develop a project that, to learn more about their experiences and needs during pregnancy, to assess how the men were treated by OB, uh, the staff at OB as part of a QI project, and to ask fathers what additional information they would like and how they'd like to receive it. This is a flyer advertising the project that we hung over, around the hospital. Um, our study sample consisted of all men attending prenatal services, including ultrasounds, with their partners at Vincent OB during a two-week period in August of 2015. Um, as men were sitting in the waiting room, they were approached by a study RA, and they were told about the study. If they agreed to participate, they were, participate, they were handed an iPad to complete a survey in two parts. The first part of the survey while they were in the waiting room to ask them about their experiences and what they were thinking about in terms of fatherhood. And then when they were checking out, they were handed the iPad again to answer a few more questions about their experience during the visit. Um, so we approached over 500 men, and 85% of them were willing to take the survey. So I just want to comment on that. Um, first of all, I think you know sometimes people think that research among fathers and men, they might be kind of a harder population to reach. We found not only 
were there over 500 men in this healthcare setting in a two-week period, which is high. I mean, it's a busy obstetrical practice, but the fathers are there. They're particularly there for the first ultrasound. They're, and we also found that they had a lot to say, 85% of them, and this was in English only, so uh, there were some exclusions made for men who couldn't uh, answer the questions in English, but they were completely willing to participate and engaged in the study. Um, so what we found, in the first part of the survey, these men indicated that becoming a father um, is stressful. 56% of them agreed that becoming a father, that agreed with the comment, becoming a father is stressful. And 26% of them reported symptoms of depression. 8% of them reported symptoms that we considered to be severe depression. This was the Center for Epidemiological Depression scale, so and the cut point that would indicate needing intervention. Um, yet these men also were full of optimism and joy. Almost all of the fathers said that they were excited to be fathers, so they're simultaneously feeling excitement and stress. Um, they felt confident in their abilities to be fathers. They came to almost all or most of the prenatal visits. They planned to be in the delivery room at birth, which we know is a strong indication of subsequent involvement. And they thought a lot and talked a lot about being a father with their partners. Um, they also indicated that they have unmet health needs of their own. So 96% of the fathers agreed that their health is important for the health of their infant. We literally asked, do you think that your health matters for the health of your child? And most of them agreed. At the same time, uh, we saw that 36% of them had not had a physical in the past year. That's not uncommon for men of childbearing age. 24%, as I mentioned, 26% of them had symptoms of depression. Over a fifth of the pregnancies were not planned or mistimed. 50% of these fathers were overweight, 17% had obesity, about a third drank alcohol more than four to six times a week, and 12% were drinking daily, and 6.5% of these fathers were smokers. When you looked at the group of fathers who were uninsured or who were Medicaid eligible, these rates were even higher. These health needs were even more evident. 36% um, of these men indicated that they wanted more information about being a father or pregnancy's impact on men. Specifically, they wanted to know, uh, they wanted more information about what to do or expect during the pregnancy. So just like moms, they had lots of questions about the size of the baby and fruit and all those things they wanted to know. They wanted to be engaged in those conversations. Um, they wanted to know more information about their contribution to a healthy pregnancy, as well as practical parenting skills, things like changing diapers, warming bottles, how they could improve their, um, their capacity to be better dads. Um, however, it seemed as though, while it seemed as though men were generally open to engaging in discussions about fatherhood, only about half were actually asked questions by the obstetric staff. So the, this range here indicates um, whether it was the nurses, the ultrasound check, the ultrasound text or the OBGYNs themselves. Fathers were said, did any of these people actually talk to you? And um, between 50 to 60% of them did, which means that you know, up to 50% of them were not asked questions at all. So this was a significant finding because we, looked, we asked fathers if they had other places to go to ask questions. Um, and only 42% and 42% of them said that they didn't have anywhere else to go to ask questions about fatherhood. And this was especially true among uh, the men who were publicly insured. The poor, the poor men, almost 60% of them reported not having anywhere else to go to seek advice or encouragement about fathering. I think this part was an interesting response because there are, in fact, a lot of fatherhood initiatives. Um, but these entities, while they are essential to promote men's health, they are typically siloed from maternal and child health initiatives that focus on women and children. So most programs aimed at helping parents focus on moms, where there's only a few programs that actively seek father participation. So I wanted to think about how we might change that. And when I went to Indiana, I um, reached out to the Indiana Nurse Family Partnership Program who, um, to see if they'd be interested in engaging fathers in some of their home visiting initiatives. The Indiana Nurse Family Partnership is an evidence-based community health pro home visiting program that partners low-income, Medicaid-eligible pregnant women with a registered nurse who delivers home visits throughout the child's second birthday. Um, so the women are enrolled in the first trimester of pregnancy and they receive ongoing care through 24 months postpartum. This is a national program that was first implemented over 40 years ago and has since been linked to numerous maternal and child health be benefits. It's very evidence-based. Um, in Indiana, the program began in 2011 with funding from the Affordable Care Act. 
Um, since 2011, it's served almost 2,000 women, the majority of whom um, are young, unmarried, minority women. Like the vast majority of home visiting programs in the US, I think there are a few exceptions, um, but Indiana, the Indiana Nurse Family Partnership was developed explicitly to target pregnant women and mothers of young children as their primary clients. So fathers are not integrated into their programming at all. And I think, again, that this is a group, that this is a captive audience. So I approached NFP to see whether they might be interested in implementing strategies to engage fathers in their services. Um, the director of NFP was really interested in this topic. So last year, we started to work together on a qualitative research project aimed to understand the experiences of fathers in the program. We recruited first-time English-speaking biological fathers whose partners are enrolled and active in the Nurse Family Partnership to complete an in-person interview about their experiences. This is an ongoing project, so today I'm just presenting some really preliminary um, findings from these, the first 17 interviews. The main purpose of the interviews was to understand fathers' attitudes about fatherhood um, and their perspectives and experiences within the program itself. So in general, these interviews revealed first that fathers love their children and they desire to be good fathers. All of the fathers who participated in the interviews expressed these sentiments. Um, nevertheless, fathers' perspective of what constitutes an ideal father varied. Most fathers noted that an ideal father is someone who's there for their children, um, provides for them, and acts as a role model. This father said, it's exciting being someone's father. You're going to watch him grow, teach him things, help him become a man but you don't want to make any small mistakes that can lead him down the wrong path, and you don't want to be, not be in his life when he really needs you. So again, that role modeling. His father said, when I think about being a father, I think about all the dads that be running away. Growing up, I'd be like, what do they run away for? Because it's easy. What is being a father like? I don't know. It's just having someone rely on you like Superman. That's all. It's just unconditional love. They're going to love you regardless, up or down. When asked to describe what being a father meant to them, it was clear that being a father changes how men think about themselves. Men described a shift in priorities and responsibilities that accompanied becoming a father. His father said, stuff changes. You can't only think about yourself anymore. Before, it used to be like, quote, I don't need to buy that food right now because I can just wait until tomorrow or something. Or I'd spend all of my money in one weekend and just be like struggling the next weekend. But now it's different. I actually plan and try not to spend everything all at once because I will have stuff set up for my son because he needs food and he needs diapers and all that other stuff. This father said, I think of myself as kind of like grown man status now. I just think I got to do stuff differently. Things I used to do, I can't do no more. I want to do the right thing for my son and be there for him, like staying out of trouble, hanging around the right people, going to work, doing that type of thing. Since he came, it's like a change of direction. He's changed my life. I'm, gonna try to, I'm trying to do better, be better for him. It was also clear from the interviews that fathers' ex expectations and experiences of fatherhood were shaped by their own past experiences, most particularly their relationships with their own fathers. Um, so for many fathers, when they said they wanted to be there, being there meant providing a positive example, and it meant breaking negative cycles from their past. So a lot of the fathers did not have positive experiences with their own fathers, and most reported their father's absence, saying things like, a lot of these kids out here don't have a lot of support or want to go down the same path as their parents did. I grew up in a really rough predicament, and that's something I don't want my son to go through. So it was more motivating for me to get my son on a better path than what I grew up with. And this is from an 18-year-old father who actually had a lot of insight into thinking about the kind of father he wanted to be. I'm excited to be able to be there because my dad was never there. He left when we were three years old, so we didn't see him until we were like 15. I see him as a man, someone I don't want to be like. That's what I'm trying to, do, to be better than he was. Um, but not all fathers viewed their relationships with their own fathers negatively. This father said, and I think this is really great, he said, I always wanted to be a dad. I know how much I admired my dad, and to give that to someone else is just awesome. Yeah, that's what I'm doing now, and it feels so good. Uh, in terms of the Nurse Family Partnership, fathers of newborns and infants, they valued the medical and developmental information their home visitors provided. Fathers expressed pride in the developmental milestones and achievements that their children reached through, through, as a result of the home visitor, um, as a result of the nurse visiting. In general, fathers felt that the moms had a positive relationship with their home visitors, they saw their home visitors as trusted sources of information. 
So when asked about the Nurse Family Partnership, one father said, the Nurse Family Partnership definitely helped me a lot, learning all the basics up to continuing to learn how to take care of him and learning what milestones he should be reaching. It's definitely been very helpful. I think most people should be in a program like that, at least on their first child. So again, this kind of called back to the obstetrical study when we asked fathers what, what they wanted. They want practical parenting skills. They want to be hands-on and they want to know how to do that in the best way for their children. This father said, the Nurse Family Partnership taught me how to interact with my child, how to help him, stuff I didn't know about that the nurse taught me. And I thought, oh, cool, I'm going to try that or I'm going to do tummy time, tummy time and skin to skin and all that. It's just I didn't know about any of that. This father said, the Nurse Family Partnership has been essential on me getting serious about things. I haven't been totally alone in shaping who I am as a father. Knowing that there is a group of people who are actually willing to work and help fathers be better fathers, it's good. And this called back to the report that we had from a completely different setting, the obstetrical setting, where fathers were saying they didn't really have a lot of places or people to go to for support. Finally, fathers expressed interest in a variety of services that home visiting programs or other programs serving families could provide. So similar to what we found in our obstetrical study, fathers wanted practical information about how to care for their children. They want how to play, feed, burp, change diapers. They also wanted services that could help strengthen their relationships with the mothers of their children, which I think is really important, um, or to better provide for their families. Involving fathers in the nurse family partnership would be useful for fathers. It doesn't have to be overbearing. Dads want to be more involved and being able to con um, have a constructive conversation is a big part of it, especially when my wife and I aren't always going to agree, but we can always agree that we want what's best for our child, for our kids, sorry. This father said, the NFP is helpful for first generation immigrants like us because we don't have family in Indianapolis. When you don't have anybody around, that's when it's helpful to have somebody come in and tell you what you need to do. It's teaching my kid how to care too. Seeing this organization reach out to other families and their kids has given me life in a way. And when you grow up, you don't forget it. And then it's your turn to reach out to other people and do the same thing. They care for you, so it's your job to care for other people too. That's the message. So just to wrap this up, the Life Course Perspective is increasingly being recognized for its value to understanding maternal and child health and health disparities. However, a huge omission from this research, from research using this approach, has been the role of fathers as a critical part of the family system. I found in my life course research um, that when you apply the life course approach to understanding how fathers influence maternal and child health, um, they in fact make unique contributions. And it's clear that, that men are willing to engage in discussions about fatherhood during the prenatal and early childhood periods, both in healthcare settings and in community settings. I think this points to an opportunity to improve family health by increasing father participation in these settings. That's it. Thank you.